another episode of the Bobcast, episode number six of the 2019-2020 uh, school year. And my name is Fielder Dennis. I'm here with Coach Brian Parker. We are talking women's soccer. Coach, an 0-2 week, uh, both co- uh, losses coming in a result of a 1-0. These games tend to be just, you know, a couple bounces leads to a different result. It was, do you think that was the case in game one and game two this past week? Uh, not really. I think I think Fairmont was better. I think Fairmont was just better on the day, had more energy, you know, the first, the, the midweek game. Um, we had a slow start. It's kind of a thing of ours, you know. I think teams probably realize they can jump on us early. And Fairmont was excited, has great athletes, very athletic, maybe the most athletic team, you know, from front to back that we've probably played yeah. uh, this year. So credit to Fairmont. They persisted. They got the goal, um, unfortunately, on a set piece that we had expected, actually, and rehearsed, which is a bit frustrating. Um, but uh, uh, second game, we were way better. You know, D&E, we matched up well with them, allowed that early goal, responded well, and just, I mean, completely took it to them in the second half and really did deserve a goal. Created five or six great chances, including one off the bar, a couple sitters for our strikers who, who would normally at least make the keeper act. You know, we, we missed a couple, you know, um, that I think could have equalized. So much better performance overall against D&E, mm-hmm. but I think Fairmont is, in, in my view so far, I think is kind of the standard in the North, ex, you know, especially in terms of just athleticism and, and uh, you know, energy. You mentioned, you said it already here today, that in the FSU, the Fairmont State, rather, uh, matchup, a, a sluggish first half. What did you mean by that uh, in particular, looking back? Was it more of a an energy thing or – that was probably the latest game, home game that you've had this year. Do you think that could have played a factor into it? I wish I knew. If yeah. you could, you know, I talked to the player. We That's talk what about, we're, we're talking it out now. Yeah, I, we talk <laughs> about it all the time. You know, what, what can we do in terms of pregame rituals, preparation, uh, whether it's analysis be, before, whether it's, you know, literally what we eat, how we act, what we do in the pregame. I think we just focus on trying to have a consistent approach and hope that that consistent approach, you know, results in a good preparedness mentally and, and obviously physically. I just think Fairmont's athleticism took us by surprise, frankly. I think they just jumped on us and were excited, and we didn't match up well with them in several areas of the field. You know, more areas, more positions, I would say, than, than other teams. Like I said, I, th- I think they're the most athletic team uh, at, at every position that we've probably played. So, So it took some adjustment, and we – kind of got the fire lit, so to speak, and, and I think the second half was much more equal in terms of possession and, and decent passes and, you know, each team pressuring each other. But, um, you know, it's tough to – you can't wait to get the engine going. I mean, mm-hmm. it's kind of interesting how soccer is a 90-minute game, 90 minutes of action, so longer than a lot of sports play, but only takes one moment to right. completely change the entire thing. I talk to basketball and volleyball coaches all the time, and they'll say, oh, we were terrible for 10 minutes. And I was yeah. like, terrible for 10 minutes, you won the game. Yeah. If we're terrible for 10 seconds, maybe, on a free kick, exactly. it's over. So the concentration level does have to be really high, and, and we're learning, you know, but we've we've had a few lapses, for sure. Shahidi and Curtin have been at the top of the MEC in points this season. How have they developed a one-two punch uh, offensively with kind of con- uh, contrasting styles? Uh, Curtin uses her size a little more. Shahidi with her quickness and just her overall just tenacity to get to the ball. How have they developed a, a one-two punch? Well, it's been fun to watch. It, you know, and like you said, they do play off each other and have different, uh, you know, bring different things to the game in terms of athleticism and and in even you know what they do with the ball. Um, you know, Audra's just a young player who's just gaining in confidence, and I still feel like there's another gear for her, to be honest. Like, mm-hmm. I think she could be a much more dominant player. I think we're going to see that over time. But I think she's just kind of growing into her role on the team and, and uh, you know, is a, is a, is a very um, lighthearted, you know, just kind of fun person to be around. And I think that some players just need to learn how to turn that switch a little bit better and just get that sort of determined focus about them and really – uh, kind of become more more grinders, you know, and I think uh, I think that she's kind of learning that to kind of you know bring that focus to a different level. But and, but I think she's been fun to watch. And Brooke is just a you know a Tasmanian devil she who's is. just she who's is. just going to run and work and pressure and create chances. And to be honest, Brooke has a little bit of the opposite problem. Often I'm asking Brooke to calm down, you know, yeah. to just slow down and calm down and think about things and and just be a little bit more deliberate, especially of course with her finishing as a striker. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, picking and choosing when to run and, and show that explosiveness, I think, is – Brooke has a habit of just running herself in the ground for five minutes and then 
then for five minutes she can't do much. Yeah. You know, so her fitness is great and she's an athlete, but I think, you know, she's still learning how to pick and choose and, and be a little more deceptive, I would say, in how she runs and, and uh and, and that's happening. We've seen some different um lineup switches, some some new names kind of coming out into the field. We've seen a lot more of Danielle McLean in these past few matches. She's been playing a little bit up top, sometimes in back, kind of everywhere, uh, jack of all trades, if you will. Uh, obviously, we've seen Helen Francis coming and playing in uh, playing a lot of minutes in, in matches, and then uh, Marley Copes has has played well against uh, Davis and Elkins. Have you just are you just still kind of figuring out this lineup situation and trying to mix and match, or, or is it just a kind of a uh, situation where you want to get everyone going i mean uh, it's a both right part of it is just in form who's in good form who's yeah. feeling good playing good helen and marley actually both were ill last weekend didn't make the trip to notre dame didn't play at all mm. so we had a little virus go through the campus which happens on probably every college campus <laughs> yeah. when you know in around mid-september and so hopefully we're through that and and so a lot of it is just health and well-being of the players but also how they're playing and what kind of energy they're showing and and how they're training Danny McLean is a great example of a kid and that we hold her up to the other players all the time. Just a ball of energy. Just works, works, mm -hmm. works. And so what she will do, whatever she's doing in training in the game, she's going to raise the level of everything she does. She just flies around. She's persistent. She's determined. You know, I think we all admit she's not a, a, a technical wizard. She's not the best skillful player on the team. But, man, does she fly around. And, to, and when we need – energy and just and just that consistent output from from a player she brings it so we kind of needed that up front a little bit and I think that we decided to try her up there I think first in the Notre Dame game and she responded really well really really well so you know if you perform in the practice and you're you know you're always trying to make five minutes into 10 into 20 you know of course as a player and then turn that into starts and so yep. um, Danny McLean gets that and works hard and, and she's just being rewarded for just a persistent effort and and energy and I, I really appreciate that very much Helen, of course, is just a skill wizard, and, and I think she started the season late. She had a little bit of – she actually had an auto accident, and, and it wasn't seriously hurt, but had to, had a very slow start to the preseason for that reason. And so is now just kind of regaining her fitness and her form. And, you know, she's just magical with the ball. It just frustrates opponents, you know, yeah. because she can just – has a couple particular moves where she can really frustrate people and has a great speed of play. So now that she's in good form and her fitness is back, she's in the rotation, and we started her. Um, you know, against D&E, &E, and, and uh, she had a nice impact on the game. Sophomore Stephanie Fajetsi has been in fray in the last two matches. How has she looked in these MEC matchups? Well, you know, as a goalkeeper in any sport, you have to always just be prepared, and when you get that chance, you make the best of it, and so Steph has done that. I think she's obviously consistent and, and capable and smart and, and calm and, and good with her feet, and those things have uh, enabled us to, to, to sustain a, a level of quality in the goal that's been awesome. She hasn't given much away. Um, you know, she may not be capable of making the outrageous save, you know, yeah. that you maybe is the, like the unexpected thing may mm -hmm. not happen. Um, but, she, you know, her consistency and, and has developed – she's developed a confidence that has, you know, the team's confidence in her and her, confident, her, her confidence in herself that's, that's been great. You know, the other two keepers are going through some injury issues right now. One will be cleared soon. One will be cleared in a few weeks. And so – Probably, certainly before the end of the season, may, maybe in a week or two. So the competition will be back, and there'll be a, probably a little bit more of a rotation, but she's making it difficult for us to to uh, to, to make that change. So uh, full credit to her. In the game with uh, D&E, uh, what, what did you see that was uh, a, the difference in that result? And we mentioned Marley Copes earlier. Was a substitute had four shots, so she came in and gave a little instant offense off of the bench. Well, I, like I said, I think her recovery from the illness was a little slow. I think, mm -hmm. you know – I always joke that the biggest lie that college players tell you, athletes always tell you, is I'm fine, coach. You know, right. so I think she got, I think she was damaged a little bit more hurt by that illness than she was letting on. She tried to come back actually and train one day, and she, and she really shouldn't have. And so now that she's fully rested and, and getting back, I think it's just a matter of getting her fitness back. She was gassed after 15 minutes, and so mm -hmm. you know we we rotated her quite a bit. But her impact on the game as an athlete was notable, as you said, and. And that's, you know, you know, awesome. She, she's, she brings that, and she's so coachable and wants to work so hard, uh, just uh, has a lot of desire. Um, and so she's back in the rotation and can surprise some people. Um, you know, we really turned it on and kind of – we showed in the D&E game that we have a higher gear, that we can get to that higher gear. And so um, – and there was the upper-class players, you know, Brooke and Gwen and J.D., who kind of helped to elevate that in the second half um, – you know, against D&E. So I was actually pretty happy Saturday that 
Um, we put, got right into the game, and, and I think any other like – if we did that again, if we had that game again, I mm-hmm. think we'd probably put a couple of those in. So I felt like we outplayed that team for enough of the game to maybe get the result, but not the 90 minutes, you know. So, we, you know, we allowed the, the early goal and, and weren't able to recover, and, and that's just going to happen in soccer. But very happy with the second-half response, and I think it, I think it's – Hopefully, you know, bodes well for the future. We'll see. This week you've got West Virginia Wesleyan College in Glenville State. Uh, West Virginia Wesleyan was one of the top teams picked in the preseason. What do these two teams present as challenges, and is that game against the other Bobcats kind of a, a, a marker for the season as a chance to, to, to play one of the better teams in the MEC? Yes, everybody's good. You know, everybody – and, and you know, is the South better than the North? You know, I don't know, maybe. You know, I think there's three or four very good teams on each half. All the points count the same, even though it's a it's a divisional setup. You get two chances, you know, two cracks at the, the the folks on your half. But how well we do against the southern group teams is is equally as important. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all these games have you know are like I said have the same weight in terms of the standings. But West Virginia Wesleyan is, I still believe, is the standard. They're the defending champs, and they, you know, he cranked up the schedule and they had a little rocky start, but I'm sure it helped them. You know, just raise their game and sure. and they just got a great result against Fairmont. So who I just said was maybe the best team in the North. So mm-hmm. they're they're going to be tough, real tough. They'll be very tough at their place. I mean, it's rainy. They have this grass field I'm nervous about. Yeah. So, you know, who knows how that's going to go. It's been dry for a month, and then it's really rainy. It's not, not probably the best situation. But, um, you know, we'll adapt, and, and we'll, we'll be fine. I, I think, again um, – you know, the pressure's probably more on them. You know, they're probably more desperate to not give away points at home than, than we necessarily need them. But, mm-hmm. but again, it's all, uh, you know, all the points count the same. And so we'll do our best to prepare and, and scout them a bit and, and see how it goes Wednesday. I don't like to think about Sunday when you ask me, you know. <laughs> Glenville is supposed to be, you know, the new program that's not getting results, but they've obviously got a few this year. And so yeah. I'm not going to take them for granted at all, and, and I, I think just like we asked the players, we're going to try to take the same approach to every game and make sure we're prepared and scout them and make sure nothing surprises us. But certainly will be nice to play at home on the weekend, get the, get the families, you know, mm-hmm. in town. And, and uh, you know, we look forward to that, but, we're, you know, when Wednesday is, is coming right around the corner. Coach, looking forward to this week's slate of games. Coach Brian Parker, always good to talk with you. Looking forward uh, to this week and uh, more conversations in the future. Thanks. Back here on the Bobcast, we're talking men's and women's tennis. My name is Fielder Dennis. We are with Coach Jeff Splinter. And, Coach, you had a canceled event yesterday against Waynesburg. But a full week of practice, how did you utilize the time spent uh, on the courts? Yeah, so we just took what we learned from this past weekend uh, at the ITA tournament and at the uh, Goucher invite for the men and the women. And we wanted to compare ourselves to the, the teams they played, especially on the men's side, going to the – the regional tournament, seeing the best teams and, you know, how they play, how they practice, their mentality. Uh, we just had the guys share that first day to the rest of the team with the attitude, with the effort, and let letting everyone know that they're just not that far ahead of us. So, yeah. you know, mentality-wise, I think that's our strongest point right now is we have a, a desire to get better, a desire to really compete with the best teams and – you know, depending on how good they are, it's not going to matter. It's, just, you know, our effort's always going to be the same. So that's the one thing we're really proud of with the guys and the girls is, you know, everyone is really putting in everything they have. I've used this term measuring stick a lot with a lot of the coaches here, uh, and it's mainly from going from the Division three to Division two measuring stick in terms of playing these other teams in conference. And, and for you, it's going on to these regional tournaments and matching up. Do you think those opportunities are important for, for your team? And uh, did, do you think your team utilize uh, those opportunities as measuring sticks? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it gave us a good opportunity to, you know, measure ourselves up against the other teams and see the preparation, um, the level of play you can see was a lot higher and, you know, we recognize that the consistency is probably the most defining point between us and them where, you know, we can hit those shots one out of every five right now and every other team is looking four out of five, five out of five. So, you know, what do we have to do in practice in order to make that consistency go up is what we've really been focusing on. Um, so we've been focusing a lot on the approach shots and all the put away shots that we can be a little bit more aggressive on and really – taking it to them when the time comes and just being consistent until then, you know, waiting, waiting it out. Tennis is all about, you know, kind of 
reading your opponent, getting a feel for them, uh, hitting back and forth until an opening arises. So we have to limit the window, limits arise, and widen the gap of um, when we can attack. The fall season has ended for the for the men's uh, team as of now. Uh, we'll see if that Waynesburg game gets rescheduled. Um, from them, what did you see uh, improvements improvement wise from the previous season to this season and uh, really just mainly individually what did you see uh, fr- from this team that that really encouraged you yeah I think the biggest thing was we lost almost all of our leadership from last year mm-hmm. I think we lost maybe five out of six starters close to that maybe not quite that but um, I think losing six seniors on the men's side last year was was a big hit to the team um, but they didn't take it in a negative, we came back this semester and everyone was just as hungry. Everyone from last year improved. We brought in a lot of uh, talented first year players. Um, so I think, you know, replacing them is this semester has been a an opportunity to get close to each other as teammates, kind of figure each other out a little bit more, you know, finding new doubles combinations, finding finding things that work. So we've really taken that challenge of being able to kind of reestablish ourselves and and kind of build that culture that we want to have moving forward. Much like the construction going on outside by the courts and on the courts here recently, you are constructing a roster and constructing a culture uh, for your team. Do you see some parallels in, in between uh, the fact that the you get to go from fall to spring and there's such a gap uh, in in the second year that, that you're here. Well, not second year you're here, but in your years that you've been here comparatively to this year, is there anything different in terms of your culture building or, or your roster individually? No, I think we're just continuing to build what we have been the last three, three and a half years that I've been mm-hmm. here. Yeah, every year has gotten much, much better the buy-in from the players have, have gotten extremely – it's 100% now. Everyone is all in. And, you know, we're not changing anything. We've gotten a little bit more strict in terms of, you know, what we're doing at practice, making sure that we're staying focused. Um, but that's that's a credit to the to the players on the team. You know, it's, they want that accountability. They want to be better. Um, you know, my first year or two here, maybe that wasn't the case where – and, and now, you know, we're focusing on things that, you know, make us as better tennis players, make us better people, make us, um, you know, well, well-rounded well human beings, hopefully, and, you know, successful in the classroom. Uh, staying on the men's side, looking forward to the spring season, what do you want to use uh, that, that ha- happened in the fall into the spring? That's when it really, you know, gets ramped up. What did you see that you want to carry over into the spring? Yeah, I want to continue um, really focusing on doubles. Doubles mm-hmm. is really short in Division Two with uh, uh, first to six, so um, it's getting out to a very strong start. You know, we fo- we told in practice we are focusing on what we can control, and that's our serve. So uh, really want us to hold serve more. You know, I told told the guys this week that I want to see competitiveness. You know, yeah. I don't want to see the six O's the 6060s and sets you know if we're competing that looks like a 62 looks like a 63 64 mm-hmm. you know give me a tie break it's um you know really focusing on every single point and how we can win that point you know we've given up too many free points because we miss serves we miss returns and you know we, the last week of practice going up into Waynesburg we are focusing on first serve percentage and return percentage and you know I was keeping track of that in practice you know, the first day was about 50% first serve percentage. And, you know, we, we worked our way up to where we want to be, which is 75, 80% first serves in play, especially in doubles, getting our partner involved more. Moving to the women's side of things, they uh, will host Cal U here on Frostburg State's campus. Um, what do you want to see in that matchup? And I'll ask you a little bit of a bigger picture question. Uh, what have you seen from from the women's side that has been encouraging? Yeah, so we're looking for, uh, I think this is going to be a, a nice competitive match. I think it, it'll be a, a longer, drawn-out match. Um, you know, again, hoping for 
nice and competitive sets. We're looking for our top of the lineup to compete a little bit more than they have in the past. Um, so and I think we had a couple of injuries that are now kind of dealt with and behind the mirror. So I think our lineup is going to get a little bit stronger than what it was mm -hmm. um, and deeper. And I think, you know, I know what we're going to get from our four, five, and six and our, our second and third doubles because they're, they're relatively very strong compared to you know the rest of who we've been playing so i want to see that top of the lineup really step up and you know act call the answer or pick up the call of you know hey this is going to be a nice competitive match and, and let's keep it that way and then you know looking into second question you know we're looking at um, being more more precise setting ourselves up in doubles a little bit more. Um, you know, women's doubles is a little bit more of classic one up, one back. And we've been focusing on trying to get both of our players to the net, put balls away a little bit easier. We know if we have two up at the net, the gr point is greater. We're going to win more points if we're both at the net and putting pressure on our opponents. Coach, you've got Cal U and then you play Clary and later and the following week and in the women's, uh, fall season other, unless the Waynesburg game gets rescheduled a uh, match will get rescheduled uh, it, it's over I'll ask you the same question that I asked you about the men's uh, what did you like what you saw from the entire women's side uh, as a unit yeah uh, I thought it was 100% different uh, our lineup is mostly the same we lost our top two players from last year uh, and then everyone else is is very similar in, in the lineup so um, just been really impressed with the change of mind the change of attitude people have had in practice I've demanded a lot more of them this semester in terms of committing themselves to the team focusing on certain shots and um, just kind of the mindset and uh, that's been the thing I've been most proud of is you know our women are are competing they're they're focused they are you know really patient with one another and um, it's really starting to show in our match play where you know, this past weekend at Goucher, a couple weeks, what was it, last weekend now, mm -hmm. um, you know, some good results and some competitive results. So I'm looking for that to continue. You know, it's exactly what we talked about with the guys, uh, less of the 6 0 6 0s. We're not seeing that much on the women's side anymore. So now it's about going out and winning those close matches. So uh, I think these next three matches, because we have Calu, Clarion, and Bethany, um, we're looking at winning those close sets and, you know, putting putting shots away when we need to um, and not spoiling leads and really yeah. focusing on, on that point that matters. Coach Jeff Splinter, always a pleasure to talk with you. Looking forward to the tennis upcoming here, and then we'll ramp it back up come springtime. Thanks for joining us on the Bobcast. Thank you. Back here on the Bobcast, presented by the Bobcast Sports Network. My name is Fielder Dennis. I'm talking cross country with head coach Shane Brookshire. Coach, you headed to familiar Salisbury University in Salisbury, Maryland, familiar for most Bobcats here, uh, to run the Don Cathcart Invitational. What did you see from the two squads in that event? Uh, lots of PRs. Uh, that's definitely for sure. Like, we uh, – uh, had our best races of the year at this meet, which I was not expecting. Like I had a feeling that we would run fast and uh, do well as a team, but uh, I did not anticipate uh, nearly every single athlete running their personal best time. Like, so it, it was a great day. Coach, you look, going through the story uh, this weekend that was that was written. PR was the was the main uh, abbreviation that I was I was jumping uh, was jumping around the page. The Bobcat men earned 191 points for their seventh place finish, 41 points behind sixth place West Virginia Wesleyan. Uh, what do you do? You see this as a measuring stick uh, for the MEC going forward? Uh, yeah, like it was. Uh, I said to come away with our best times on the season. Like we're still. Um, like one, I, I still believe that we're sitting about fifth place in the MEC. Uh, two, like it just showed that um, no matter how many athletes are in the race, like Lockhaven had nearly 400 guys, this race only had 150 about, and like they could still run fast. And that was my biggest concern was that if we didn't have the amount of athletes that we did at Lockhaven, like would they still produce times and uh, everybody actually like stepped it up a lot more. So um, I think this is a good showing of like uh, that we can run in whatever conditions are 
presented to us. Do you think there's a little extra motivation when uh, some of the runners see uh, orange and white from West Virginia Wesleyan, the other Bobcats in the MEC, to try and get in front of those guys and, and try and uh, you know outpace them, if you will? Yeah, it's uh, definitely motivation on that side and stuff. And like, and I mean, they're they're hungry for conference. Like, they're excited to get there now, especially like uh, that they're really starting to see their fitness level come in. And uh, several of them had made comments like after the race saying that. Um, I had promised them lots of PRs this year, and uh, and those times are starting to come together. Like so, anytime you run well on any kind of a course, like um, you're definitely going to be looking forward to the uh, actual conference championships. Those come up. Those are coming up in a couple of weeks here. But Junior Braxton Clark will be looking forward to those. He was for Usberg's top finisher, finished 13th overall with a personal best 26-16. He's been an FSU's top runner in uh, all four meets this fall. We talk about him every week. Uh, but how has he just solidified a role in the top echelon uh, of these races? Uh, mileage. It just comes down to the mileage that he did over summer, as I've talked about in the past. Like uh, he had hit several 100-mile weeks over summer. Like uh, he put in the work. Like it definitely shows when he's running high 27s, low 28s last year, like for the 8K, and now uh, this year for the second meet in a row, he goes into the 26s, like PRs by 16 seconds. Um, like he's on the verge of breaking 26 and. It really just comes down to the uh, mileage and the work that you put in over summer that if you're willing to uh, step that up, then the results will pay off like during the season. Coach, I've seen him uh, this early in this year. It seems like everywhere I'm somewhere on campus, whether it's a track or driving around downtown, I see him running around everywhere. So those mileage, that mileage is being tallied up, and it's really showing a uh, paying dues going forward. Senior uh, Jacob Rickards was 38th overall with a personal record. That word again of 27-22. The fourth straight meet in which the Port Republic native was the second finisher for the Bobcats. Uh, how has he grown as the season con continues, and and has he and um, Clark become kind of a one-two punch at the top. Yeah, like he's uh, he's healthy this year, and that's been the biggest thing, like compared to last season. Um, and he he also is one that put in the mileage over summer. Like, I believe he was in uh, somewhere up to about 60 miles a week, like 65 miles a week, and uh, which is a good healthy amount, and shows that he's uh, completely healthy from his injury from uh, last fall. Um, like the workouts, like, I mean, him and Braxton work out together on Monday, Wednesday mornings, like, and so they've got good familiarity with each other, and, like, he's, uh, like, he's definitely stepped up as one of the leaders as well, like, not just, um, like, performance-wise, but just, like, character-wise on the team, and so it's a great transition to see him, like, this year, like, to also see his times drop. I mean, these are faster than his freshman year times. Yeah, that's that's very impressive. And, and do you think uh, that, that the competition within the team, like you said, training on Mondays and Wednesday mornings, being together at, at all times, that's got to you know uh, grow some comp competition and brew some some uh, rivalries within the own, your own team, which is a good thing for going into meets running against other other squads. Yeah, like we have, uh, we don't have a set top seven per se. Like it is. Um, I mean, after our one, two, three with uh, Daniel Foster in there as well, up there with Jake, like uh, our four, five, six, and seven have been trading spots the whole season. Like uh, this last meet, it was uh, Tim Wolotkin. Like uh, prior to that, it was Lorenzo Wilson, like uh, Devin Horseman guy at the um, uh, Hood College meet. Like every single meet, it's kind of been a different individual in that number four five six seven spot and so uh, my goal for uh, that whole group is to get them to move closer to jake and daniel sophomore brendan tomasoni crossed the finish line in 86th with another personal record 29 39 what have you seen from him here early in the season uh, he's definitely got a lot of strength like he's um um like he has um like come a long ways like he hit a huge pr this past weekend running the that 29 39 I believe it was right, and so twenty ninth, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, and so, um, like he's like he's one of those guys that's in the mix for the top seven and stuff. Like he's uh, shows up, like works hard every single day, like uh, does what he's supposed to be doing, and then um, like he gets into the meets and he's aggressive during the meet, and uh, like he's 
right in the mix for like potentially being our number four guy like it's just a a matter of it all coming together and I've um, talked to him like this weekend after the race and like I mean this was a huge PR he ran a smart race like um, I think that he still has a lot more time to drop especially uh, when he gets into his junior and senior years now like and same with like several of the other guys is that once they get used to my system, like used to the kind of training, then they start to see their times drop even more. Moving to the women's side, sophomore Natalie Gray was 77th with a time of 27.43, which was a, a, a personal best for her. How has she developed? And on the women's side, what have you seen from them that's that's encouraging going forward? I know it's not easy for the women this year. Like they've got um, – we're down to just uh, three athletes. Uh, Ariana Ward was unable to compete this weekend, but – uh, Natalie and uh, Isabel Pereira like um, like it's not easy just having a couple people at practice all the time yeah. and so like they've put in some great work like uh, doing the best that they can with what they're given and um, Natalie dropped 45 46 seconds off her best time from her freshman year like um, like that was that would put her like low 23s for 5k right now and which is great like she's starting to get into the shape that she was in at the high school level and uh so um i know she's been dealing with a couple of uh shin issues and like we're like kind of restructuring the training to keep her healthy for the meets and like it's obviously working like uh she's put in the work and then isabel Pereira, like as well like uh she's actually running now 6k times that she was running for the 5k last year in high school like and so she's a whole 1k faster than what than she was and like and we just haven't we haven't been able to get the mileage in that we would like to normally do but uh like the girls have been great like they've uh like been, they've been tough like just as tough as the guys and like if not tougher with the situation that they have it's popularly known that running is such a mental uh, the mental aspect is your biggest opponent, really. And it's got it's very impressive to see, you know, Natalie Gray and Isabel, you know, just knock time on their personal record, uh, personal, yeah, personal best, because we, as we talked about with the men, you've got that competition brewing with, with so many athletes you can compete against one another. You know, they've only really kind of got each other. So to have them improve their times, that's really impressive to see as the season goes on. It's amazing to see, like, um, I mean, they've, they're the workhorses and stuff like uh they come to practice do what they're supposed to do like they don't complain like they just show up and do work and i mean and when they run huge prs like they both did this weekend and kind of like jump started our race on saturday Mm -hmm. and they they ran first and like uh when they ran uh those two prs like you knew it was going to be a great day for frostburg and so like i said they've They've put in the work, and they deserve a lot of credit for uh, what they've done this year because, um, yeah, they they got to battle that mental side of it's just them at practices. Like, no nobody to really feed off of, nobody to really push off of except for each other. And, um, like, going to these meets where it's just them and, like, they don't have a full team, like mm-hmm. – I mean, they've they've done an amazing job this season, and I'm very proud of both of them. Excited to see what uh, they're going to do at the conference meet. The next meet is on the 19th. No meet this weekend, so a little bit of time off. Uh, what are you planning to do w- with this short break? Uh, right now, it's like at this time of the season, it's just all about rest and recovery. Like um, we try to stay healthy as healthy as we can. Like make sure that we're getting uh, plenty of rest. Like just easy running, like recovery runs, like a couple speed workouts uh, mixed in here and there. Um, but it's just uh, getting that mind strong now for the conference meet. Like um, trying to work on uh, more so like as a pack, like especially for those four through seven guys. Like uh, they got to stick together. They're close to each other in races. They they need to work on keeping that close throughout practices so they're used to doing it in the race and um all right so it's a little bit of race strategy which uh when we get to gettysburg uh, that's more so what we're going to be focused on is uh working together and like keeping our pack tight like and um so that we can implement that at the conference meet coach you you're going to be probably asked this in a couple of weeks uh, as the season wraps up uh the mec uh meet is i think if i'm not mistaken the 26th of october so that's a, that's a little down the road but um you know you you start the season you you, you 
basically construct your roster as is. What, what, in your opinion, has been the biggest surprise here as we start to wind down towards the end of the year? Uh, the amount that the athletes have improved. Like, it's it's not what I expected. Like, um, I mean, especially after the first meet when we had several athletes running in the 30s and 31s and mm-hmm. it's uh, kind of like, man, we're like, we're going, it's going to be a while until we can be running good times. And mm-hmm. and honestly, like, it came a lot quicker than I anticipated. Like, uh, but it's, um, I mean, they've trusted the process. I mean, I got to trust my process as well that, and not, um, try to do too much or might make too big of changes like i'd like to draw out my plan uh before the season starts and on what i feel is going to uh work best like for the workouts and uh i got i always gotta remind myself to like uh no matter what happens like to kind of uh stick to that plan and um like they've uh they've definitely have improved a lot more than i anticipated like i saw uh, I kind of saw Braxton going uh, sub 27s, like just didn't think that he would be knocking on the door of sub 26 so quickly. Like and uh, Jake and Daniel, like I mean, I saw them in the 27s, just didn't think that it would be uh, happen this quick. And like same with the others, like I think we only had one guy that was above 30 minutes, and um, like Jaden Morley, and he was a. Uh, I mean, he was looking smooth the whole way. He's got a lot more that he can put into the race, which I talked to him about that. And, um, I mean, he was only 16 seconds away from being under 30. So uh, four meets in, and we already have pretty much every single guy under 30 minutes compared to where we were at the first meet. Like, that's mm-hmm. a like, it's a big surprise. And it is something I didn't anticipate until conference. Coach, California native, but you lived in Oklahoma for a while. Red River rivalry this weekend. Do you have an opinion on how you uh, think it's going to go? Boomer sooner. Boomer sooner. (laughs) That's all you need to say. Coach Shane Brookshire, thanks so much for joining us and looking forward to to talking with you as we get towards the end of cross country and open up the track and field season. Uh, Thank you. Back here on episode number six of the Bobcast. Presented by the Bobcat Sports Network. My name is Fielder Dennis. I'm here with Coach Brian Christensen. We are talking swimming. The winter season has begun, or fall season has begun for swimming. Frostburg State swim teams open up with a 2019 uh, with a sweep of Gallaudet on Saturday. The women won their half 148 to 63, while the men dominated 174 to 76. What were your overall thoughts on the meet in Washington D.C.? Well, Fielder, first of all, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to be back on the Bobcast. Um, you know, I live for this mm. every Monday, every, every week. It's just like the only, the only thing I want to do. Um, that came out kind of sarcastic, but I actually meant it. <laughs> I realized it sounded weird. <laughs> I really uh, but, love this, but I very much like, I'm, I'm very honest. I, I, I love the Bobcast. You know this, um, we, we, we had a spectacular meet, you know, it, it really was, um, pretty great to see. I, I think, um, it, 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 it wasn't all that competitive. Um, except for a handful of races, um, you know, I think we won every race except we we lost um the um hundred IM on the women's side and uh, hundred backstroke on the men's side. Um, other than that, we, you know, we 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 swept everything. Um, which is really fantastic. Uh, and I think it's just amazing to look at us in the comparison from last year. You know, the strides that we've taken. Um, we're not looking necessarily just at times, but just how we carry ourselves, kind of the seriousness of the meet, um, you know, how, how we're, we're putting together our races, you know, our, our effort level, kind of our, our way that we come together is just like, um, I, I've been, been really impressed with this team. I, I don't think we had a meet, um, and again, not, not necessarily time wise, you know, it's like early October, we're still kind of in shape, you know, our times were kind of, we had some good times, but the time's largely not quite there yet, mm-hmm. um. But our racing was, which is what I'm looking for. Um, I was really impressed. It was a, it was a good meet. Now, coach, it's been one, it's been one meet. But um, just thinking while you were discussing uh, your overall thoughts, you know, last year you kind of you jump in here late uh, into to the season. Uh, you're you're kind of thrusted in like, okay, here's your roster. Let's start doing these meets. And now you've had a year to kind of soak it all in and. Um, just kind of put your fingerprints all over the season. Have you seen some some uh, adjustments and changes in more of a Brian Christensen style team in this in this meet? Did you see some of those adjustments and changes maybe with your fingerprints over? Yeah, it's definitely true. Um, I certainly don't want to take a lot of credit because I think you know it's really the athletes, but they're they're finally um, 
getting in. You know, I think last year was definitely an adjustment year. Um, you know, obviously Coach Anderson, uh, he was a fantastic coach. Um, I mean, Mary Wash had, had, had a kid get third in the in the hundred breaststroke at uh, nationals last year. It was two hundred. I think it was two hundred breaststroke. Um, you know, he, he, did a, he clearly did a fantastic job. Um, I think our coaching philosophies are are pretty different. Um, last year we spent a lot of time, I think, them swimming with kind of kind of my practices with like his mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, now we're swimming kind of my practices with with my mentality. And I think that shows just, you know, and that's, um, you know, kind of, kind of that alignment shows a little bit better. Um, it's less kind of having, uh, you know, two feet and two pools and, you know, part of my, part of my pun here, um, and more being, being really locked in into, you know, that, that one vision of, of what I wanted this program to be, which, um, and that's something that, that's been reflected in practice really well. Um, that I really, really, really noticed this week. A couple of kids are, um, they were, you know, looking at practices actually from last year, and I feel like we haven't done it as much, like as much yardage last yep. year. Um, but our kids are saying that practices were like way harder, and they're like, "Oh, I'm so tired." I'm like, "We're doing like a thousand yards less per day," um, <laughs> you because know, we've just been kind of easing into the season a little bit more mm-hmm. with our, because it's like so much longer. Yeah, and um, last year you kind of just jump right in. You yeah, know, I, with I would, your hiring and everything I, like that. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was hired, and they made me an offer on Friday, and the student started on Monday, and I was like emailing practices to yeah. our, our Sydney Fazenbaker, our assistant at the time. Um, I started a year and five days ago, October second, yeah, two thousand eighteen. Um, and it was definitely kind of tough. Um, but um, we we were just we're so much more locked in, um, and I think it, they're responding to it really well which is always good to see. I just spoke with Coach Shane Brookshire. He's the cross-country coach. Kind of a similar situation, kind of hired, uh, and, and just has to start the season. Do you think it just takes a, a year, really, just to kind of settle in and, and start to build um, your individual coaching style and your culture that you want to build? It, does it just take a calendar year and a day-by-day kind of thing, do you think? I feel like it takes five years. <laughs> five years really you need to graduate all the people from the other coach and kind of get the people in that you want and you know change that culture and you change need a recruiting class yeah i think it takes a full recruiting class okay and even more than that it takes a full recruiting class that hasn't had any influence of the previous coaches recruiting mm. class so four years with you, that specific coach it's hard it's gonna be yeah <laughs> it is it's a day again, by day i really if justin anderson's I, like i really respect him <laughs> we're, you know we're, we're just different that's all and he, he's clearly a fantastic coach i don't want to Never want to talk trash, because I think he did really incredible things for his program. No, I'm just I'm just asking more of an overall standpoint, like just yeah. coaching in general, not specific coaches. Sure, but sure, sure. Just coaching in general. I think that's, but I think that's very much the case. Yeah, it just takes some time. It's yeah, you need to be patient. Mm-hmm. That's for all you coaches out there who are listening, young coaches. That's right, young bucks. Don't worry. Prospective coaches. Just, just climbing that mountain one one rock at a time. That's right. What that's was right. Delane say? Burn, oh, that's burn the boat. I always think climb the mountain. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a little Fitzcarraldo, though. You know, you got to haul the boat over the mountain. Burn the boat. That's that is a reference no one will understand no, in the I, world. It went over my head. Little, little, little Werner Herzog, Fitzcarraldo. Great movie. Check it out. 1973. I'll add it to my uh, list of things to do. <laughs> Back to the meat with Galadet. <laughs> back to the meat. <laughs> Give me back on track here. <laughs> back to the meat with Galadet. Uh, you, you started the morning with victories in both uh, the, of the 200-yard uh, medley relays. That included seniors Megan Culbertson and Becca Marsh, uh, with, along with some other names. What, what jumped out to you from their performances in the 200-yard medley relays early in the morning? Uh, I thought Becca did really well. Um, she is not really a sprinter. She is more a distance person. Um, at the same time, she's, she's about the best freestyler we got this year. Um, and, uh, oh, she, she just raced really well. She looked really good in the 50. We, we, I think we might end up having her in more, more of that shorter stuff just out of necessity. Mm-hmm. Um, she was really well, uh, rain assistant, our freshman, uh, went four and on the day, um, in the back strokes and 50 free and, and in that relay, um, uh, coming off a little illness, but she swam really well. Um, I think. She was probably more disappointed with her swims than I think the coaching staff was. We thought, yeah. you know, we were like, hey, that's great. And she's like, oh, no. I'm like, no, that's, it's that's good. good to have. Um, yeah, and, and then, um, you know, Evan else kind of returners, Aubrey and and, and Culbertson, were, um, had some great races too. You know, they looked um, – it's just it's such a change. Megan especially, I think, um, 
it just just seems really fit, really in shape, um, really kind of locked in, ready to have like a good senior year, which is uh, which is fun. For the men, first year James Harmon, sophomore Luke Russell, and juniors Anthony Giuseppetti and Brady Peterson won the 200-yard medley relay with Russell making the trek at a 22.95. I'll ask you the same thing. What did you like what you saw from that group of guys? Well, we actually went one, two, three in that medley relay, which which you actually can't do. You have to – the other team has to score at least one. So in, in their um, – Meet results kind of it looks like we got fourth, but if you look at the times, we actually were one, one, two, three, which I don't know if I've ever done in my career. Um, going one, two, three in the medley relay, like it, it's phenomenal. So um, obviously, attention goes on the A, but like every single, you know, it's like twelve guys, t- twelve Frostburg Bobcats not losing um, to a single Gallaudet swimmer to start off the meet it was like phenomenal. Yeah, um, we we have not been there. I was telling these guys, I don't think we've even filled three spots in medley relay probably since like the 90s um at frostburg state which is just great um luke's 22.9 was really surprising um although eh, maybe not that surprising because he's, he's done really well in practice but i mean he had like a 22.0 last year at, at um the conference meet i i think he's um ready to do really well james Harmon, um freshman coming in you know breaststroke's obviously been kind of a um a, uh, a sore spot for us since Christian March March mm-hmm. Christian March left. Um, I shouldn't say left, graduated. Um, you know, obviously went to nationals and breaststroke fifty five in the breaststroke here. Um, yeah, James is, is. I'm I'm really grateful for him. You know, he did a time pretty close to what you know. We had Adam Stein doing breaststroke last year in conference. Right. He's he's not a breaststroker. He's our like. Myler <laughs> specialist. <laughs> not um, his forte. Happened to just kind of be the best breaststroker we had because we just had such a, a a gap there. But James was practically doing that time that Adam did uh, end of the year that last year, which is you know, and he'll he'll continue dropping a lot. Um, so really, really good things. You know, I think our we ended that, and uh, you know, one of the kids came up to me and was like, oh, "Coach, we we got some breaststrokers this year." Yeah. yeah it's, it feels like it's been it's only been one year, but it feels like it's been a while when you have that <laughs> hole. And it's kind of like we're scrambling every meet to be like, all right, you know, roulette, who's going to do breaststroke this week? You know, yeah. so it's it's really incredible to have that. And then, um, um, you know, Brady Brady had a, a great job. Brady so reliable. Um, you know, in that fly, um, we'll, there'll be a little bit of competition. You know, I think Quincy Page actually outsplit him, um, across the pool in the fifty. But um, Brady, like I don't, know, I I know he's going to do well. We'll we'll kind of see where people end up by the end of the year you then go on to win the next 15 events of the day and 22 of the first 24 events you know we've spoken about this a little bit how what does it do for the confidence uh, of the team to just be in there and be so dominant early in the season it's got to do wonders going forward yeah we had a little talk about anthony after he lost the backstroke you know i was like anthony this is unacceptable <laughs> Every... here's a standard <laughs> <laughs> um actually i was i was upset we didn't go um at one point, I was, I wanted just like one, two, three every race, but uh, that's all kind of in jest, of course. Um, right. It's pretty good. I I think it's double edged sword. You know, uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna face some um, you know some of the conference opponents: West Virginia Wesleyan, right. Dave Snellkins, Notre Dame College, and um, you know get smacked around a little bit for sure. Um, so I almost we gotta manage kind of being too confident. So you're saying that you think there's gonna be some humbling experiences going forward? I think so. Um, yeah. You know, it's all about balance, I think, and, yeah. and I think uh, it, it's obviously it's great. You know, the, what I want to focus on is not necessarily um, our times or our place, or whatever, but like just the, the way we were racing, and I think that was we were in a good spot with that. That's what I'm really trying to emphasize with our team. Um, because yeah, we are gonna face some more difficult opponents, and kind of that I think will take us down a peg. Um, but certainly right now we're we're, we're feeling pretty good. Um, you know, riding high. I I don't think I've ever had a meet like this, um, where we we really we dominated so much, which was oh, it's it's exciting. It's fun. Yeah. You spoke about Adam Stein um, a little bit earlier, and, and Junior saw your Conklin dominate the men's 1,000 yard freestyle, finishing first and second respectively. They are a minute and a half ahead of third place and over six minutes ahead of fourth. Uh, how are these guys? You know, it's the first really event of the season. What do they show you as uh, opposed to last year that was encouraging? 
they've been really consistent, which is good. Um, so, you know, it's it's tough in distance when, you know, sometimes you'll be, like, right with, with somebody stroke for stroke, and it's, like, just this, this battle that, you know, takes, like, eight, nine minutes, which is really exciting. And, you know, this means they're, they're kind of um, more in their own worlds, just kind of swimming out, um, which is another kind of challenge of, like, staying motivated when you're just kind of, you know, you're, you're kind of off in your island. Mm-hmm. Um so I, I mean, I, I was kind of like, we can kind of cruise. They, they had a lot of other races that day to kind of go for. Um, I wasn't necessarily that concerned um, with their times when they finished um, this thousand. I think Sawyer was definitely playing with the splits a little bit. He, he I think he had a lot of left, energy left over on the table. Um, and I'm just kind of swimming through it as well, which to me is fine. There's gonna be a lot of high pressure thousands in their future, yeah. which is a lot of racing. It's like. You know, we have 12 meets. It's like 12,000 yards of racing. That's right. Not including so practice. That, that's a that's, that's a good amount. So I think, I mean, I, I would say Adam's probably just happy not to be having to do the breaststroke. I think we put him in the 100 breaststroke. Oh, did you? <laughs> well, yeah, we, were, we were playing around with his bends a little bit. Yeah, that's another question. Did you, you know, again, it's the first meet, so you haven't had a ton of time to, like, uh, make adjustments. But did you kind of just throw some people in different situations just to see what would happen? A little bit. Um, I try to put people in at least one of their like A events just because I want them right kind of experience right away yeah. and to measure themselves in their best events. But then you know playing around because we can kind of afford to have some fun this meet. Um, it was tough, you know, poor guy. We really gave them an A lineup to <laughs> to deal with. Yeah. But just from the being the first meet of the year. Um, but yeah, it's a different little combination of that. You have a, a three-week break in between meets before traveling to Pittsburgh to take part in the Chatham Invitational on October 26th. What do you want to accomplish with that time off? It kind of stinks. You know, you get a great meet, and then you have to take some time off, and then you, you, you ramp it back up. Is is that a bit of a disadvantage, do you think? Are you afraid of maybe falling into complacency a little bit? No, that's very much on purpose. You know, last year we, we had eight straight weekends of meets, which was just Ooh. like really, really ran us ragged. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to kind of spread things out a little bit more this year. Um, we're actually going to take uh, this weekend off. Um, Frostburg doesn't have a fall break, but I'm kind of like creating one. Um, let our kids get, get a chance to be at home. Some of our freshmen, uh, first years, you know, they haven't been home since August. It's mm-hmm. kind of, even talking to their, you know, parents at the meet and stuff, it definitely weighs on those poor, you know, those poor kitties All right. away from home. Yeah, it's an um, adjustment of life. That's right. So uh, we'll kind of and just kind of take an, an obligation free because we really – We've had meets. We've had either practice or you know some fundraising stuff, um, some like team bonding stuff. We've had something like every weekend since the season started. So it's nice to have an obligation free week. Um, you know, I, you know, I try to hit that um, swim school life balance. Yeah, um, which I think is really important um, because then when you're in when you're here, I want you locked in pretty well. Mm-hmm. So uh, the weekend after that, we'll have a bunch of recruits up, free advertising for the October. Uh, 18th, 19th recruit weekend. Um, we're going to have a lot, like 16 recruits. Oh, awesome. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of be preoccupied with that for sure. Um, so it's like, it's then next weekend's Chatham. So mm-hmm. there's, always, there's, there's, there's always something, yeah. you know, it's not like we're necessarily loafing. Um, and in terms of our training, we're going to start amping up, you know, some coaches like to call this a uh, sucktober. We're going to get into sucktober and, it's gonna suck. <laughs> it's gonna be really hard. Well, you combine that with squat tober. You've That's got a right. lot going on. We will suck and squat, but not suck at squats. There you go. That's good. And I'm sure Kyle and his the strength and conditioning crew will be happy That's to right. hear that. And I'll give a shout out to Kyle and, and you know, I sat with Kyle and Matt at the Hall of Fame dinner this past uh, Friday. Just a, a great couple of guys. Shout out to the strength coaches who are yeah, they do a great to job. me to me, you know, the foundation of everything we do in this department. Very much the backbone of these athletes here at, at Frostburg State University. Coach Brian Christensen, we, we thank you for the time, and I'll be sure to check out the movie that you referenced that I've already forgot the title of. That's Corraldo. It's a weird movie. Uh, I will. Cla- uh, uh, what's his name? Klaus Kinski. And, uh... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be sure to uh, research that as I'd like to make sure to be uh, you know on the same page with your references as the Bobcast goes on this year. That's I'll, right. I'll be I'll be sure to tell Matt and, and Brandon as well to to stay on top of things with that in that regard. But we thank you for the time that you've spent with us here, and looking forward to talking with you the rest of the season. Because uh, again, 
Uh, it's always fun to be on the Bobcast with you. That's right. Shout out to Sarah and Missy. Go Bobcats. Thanks. Back here on the Bobcast, talking volleyball with Coach Becky Fletcher. My name is Fielder Dennis. Coach, 0-2 in the homestand this past week. Uh, what did you see from those two performances that really <laughs> stuck out? We saw, we saw some moments of genius. We played some really great high-level volleyball at some times. Um, we just couldn't sustain it long enough to compete with the teams that were the caliber that they were. In the first match with WLU West Liberty, uh, your team struggled in the second set of play after a late rally in the first set to make it close. How do you rally the troops from set to set? You only get a two-minute break there. You know, what's the conversation like uh, in between? The conversation's obviously pretty quick. We don't mm-hmm. have a lot of times um, to get down on ourselves, and we talk about that a lot, that we've got to learn learn from what we just did, learn from the la- previous ball, learn from the previous set, mm-hmm. learn from the previous couple of plays, and hopefully transfer that into our next set, into our next point. Um, and volleyball, if you let that one mistake get down on you you have games like set two where things just kind of build and build and build and you keep making mistakes upon mistakes if you let them get to you um so i think that's one of the big lessons we learned this weekend and we've been talking about how to let things roll off of our back and move on to the next point and i think finally we were able to do that in set three both days i'm not sure the scores reflect it nearly as much as how we came out in the third set and played um but you know we Volleyball is pretty neat. There's there's often another point, and mm-hmm. there's ov- a lot of the times for a point to end, somebody makes some kind of mistake, either a tactical mistake or an out of position mistake or a hitting error or an er- or an error of some sort. Um, so it's the team that can bounce back from those mistakes and learn from them and maybe correct them a lot faster than the other team that's going to be most successful. One of the oldest cliches in sports is you're, the biggest opponent you'll face is yourself. Yeah. And is, is that something you discuss in huddles? But you mentioned about how learning from mistakes and, you know, you, you get down on yourself in, in situations like that. It's it's rather easy to do. Yeah. So we well, the other – theme we've been talking about with our hitters this year is that if you can't kill the ball don't kill us so Mm. take care of it Um, put it somewhere they're not make them move a little bit Um, and throughout the year we've been a little we've been getting better at doing that Um, but as you play teams that are faster and stronger and better competition you know the last four matches we or the last four conference matches our first four conference matches have been they've gotten tougher each time we've played um, and they've been really great teams So we can't just play it safe all the time. So we have to figure out how to make those aggressive mistakes and how to take care of the ball when we need to and and maybe bring a little bit more power offensively a a lot more of the time. In the match uh, with West Liberty, Haley Ultimates ended with seven kills. How has she improved here early in the season uh, coming off of a really good uh, first-year campaign? So Haley um, had a little bit of an injury, so she was off for – uh, uh, over a week um, that trip down to South Carolina mm-hmm. um, so she her first match back was um, this past week when we or this past weekend when we played West Lib and I think she came out swinging pretty hard mm-hmm. I think that surprised even her and her teammates a little bit that she was able to swing so hard with her fingers still taped up um, it's great to have her back I think offensively she and our setter really connect and they they gel pretty well together and she's she's learned a few new offensive tricks she's hitting a slide really well this year which she has never hit before and she enjoys that and comes down and I think it puts a little pep in her step and bring a little bit more offense which is something we struggled with this weekend obviously is is helping our game and helping our young players um, just gain a little bit more confidence Edwina Linez has uh, been one of the bright spots in her first year. She seems to do it all on the floor, mm-hmm. and uh, she is uh, in the tops nationally in, in service aces uh, this season. Does she allow for some versati- versatility when constructing lineups? <sighs> some versatility. Because you look at their final stat sheet, she has a lot of aces, and she, she does a lot of the serving, but she also have. Uh, a few digs as well, and obviously assists with with setting. Yeah, so I think the thing that she does, uh, she does her jobs, and she does them very well, Mm -hmm. right? So um, she is a very consistent player across the board. She's a great server, obviously. Um, She usually starts at serve for us. Mm -hmm. Um, That's based on why we run our rotation and why our lineup is the way it is, but also because she's such an aggressive server. Um, 
she plays pretty great defense. Um, she's, she doesn't have a lot of holes in her game that people can pick on. Um, and I think that's, that's what makes her stand out. It's, it's not that she's really flashy at just one thing. It's that she's so consistent across the board at everything she does. Moving to the wheeling match on Saturday. It was homecoming weekend. Uh, what did you see from that, that match that really uh, that jumped out to you? Uh, playing a team who's top. 20 in the nation and hasn't lost a conference game uh, since in about since the conference has been around (laughs) well this what i saw was the first 30 points between both teams were extremely competitive and Mm -hmm. extremely fast and uh we came out and dug a few really hard driven hits really early and on some really long rallies with them and I think that surprised them. They they called the first time out and I think that says a lot about if you can jump out on a team and whoever calls that first time out, mm-hmm. usually the other team has a little bit of a momentum swing or a better a little bit of an advantage and that was kind of exciting for our girls to realize that hey, we're playing one of the best teams in the country right now. We are mostly freshmen and sophomores yeah. and we we hung in with them for a lot of points and I I like that. I like the feistiness that my team brought out there. I like um, that they were really aggressive, especially defensively. I think our our back row did a phenomenal job of just staying really aggressive um, and keeping us in a lot of points. Um, and, you know, the, the front row saw a really fast offense brought against them. And Wheeling runs a very fast, a very hard-hitting offense. And it was a little bit quicker than some of our girls have seen. And I'm okay with that. I, I think that we learned a lot about how much faster we need to be in what we're doing in the gym. You mentioned this, you hinted, hinted at this a little bit, but playing a team with that pedigree, what can you learn about just how they go about their business, whether it's watching them in warm-ups, seeing how they do things on the sideline? Is, is there something to be said to, from learning from a team that's had success like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really fun to see your new athletes play a caliber, a team that's that caliber. Um, We've played some great hitters and some great teams in the past. Um, Some of our our few upperclassmen have. Um, But I think that seeing our new girls come out and be like, everyone says this team's really good and Mm -hmm. we're hanging with them for points and we're doing some things. They're just stringing a few more together. Um, So I, I think just to see them have confidence in some of that and mm-hmm. I think that's what Wheeling Jesuit has is what they're doing they're very confident in what they're doing and they're very efficient in what they're doing and hopefully that my young my young team can learn that and take that with them in future matches this week you take on Fairmont State here in Bobcat Arena uh, what are you looking forward to in that matchup I think Fairmont is going to develop to be a really great rival for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and That'll I'm hoping, be FSUs. I, I think so. And they're, they're our travel partner. So mm-hmm. we play them. Mid, we're, they're the only conference team we play midweek. Um, and everyone that we play, um, play on weekends plays them. So that's mm-hmm. – it's an interesting matchup. Um, I know that I have some girls on my team that have teammates uh, – club teammates and high school teammates oh, that have not that have gone to Fairmont so I think there are some fun rivalries there mm-hmm. um but I'm I'm excited I think we're going to match up pretty well against them um I think they're they're, they're going to be big and strong but I don't think they're nearly as fast as what Wheeling is doing um and I think that our girls are excited to play at home on a weekday and we've had some great fans come out and the gym down there has been has been pretty fun to play in. Um, it's been pretty intimate, and the fans can get pretty mm-hmm. close. Um, and I, I, I think we're going to have a really great time on Tuesday. Then you have 10 days off until the next match. Yeah. What do you want to accomplish in those days off? You know, there's some, there, the one big thing that we need to do is get a little bit of rest. Mm. Um, we, rest we've had a pretty... We've had a pretty tough travel schedule, so I think that we're we're looking forward to Tuesday and then getting some recovery in our training. Um, so maybe doing some a little bit more skills breakdown, a little bit more individual stuff. Um, but really, it just a weekend off is not something that we're used to here at Frostburg right. um, in the volleyball season. So having a couple of days just to recruit recoup mentally and physically is pretty exciting coach becky fletcher thanks for the time and looking forward to tuesday's match with fairmont state thanks episode six of the bobcast where you're talking football my name is fielder dennis we are here with head coach delaney fitzgerald coach 
Big win on homecoming, 24-16, to the final over Urbana. The Blue Knights out of Ohio travel to Bobcat Stadium. What was it like getting a big win at homecoming here this year? We expect to win every single homecoming, but it was nice. Fielder's nice. It's, it's always nice to win the big ones, and young men played played hard, played well on Saturday. We're proud of them as a coaching staff, as a university. We're, we're proud of the way our guys are playing. Pete Mayer at halftime said the same things uh, when we discussed – his first half uh, thoughts, he said the, guy, the the kids are playing hard. The team controlled the tempo for the majority of the game. How important is it for your team to control the pace uh, in terms of getting a positive outcome? Yeah, for first year Division Two, and uh, we're not as well funded as some of the teams that we're playing. So, so it's important that we control the pace of the game and keep everything close. Now, at the end on Saturday, it got a little closer than we wanted it to be. Um, Fielder, I don't care what sports you're playing, baseball, football, basketball. If you control the tempo, you have an opportunity to control the score, and you have an opportunity to control the game from start to finish. The first drive of the game is really a tone setter, 14 plays, 75 yards. What does dominating the initial drive do for the confidence of the entire team? Is it a chance for them to exhale a little bit after you know everyone's getting a little amped up with, with uh, homecoming and a lot of people in the stands tailgating and whatnot? Yeah, I don't, you, you you pay attention to that stuff. I, our players can't tell you if anybody's tailgating and amped up and all that. Our, our players and coaches probably can't tell you what half of the homecoming festivities are and what, what's going on. And you go back to the first drive of the game. First drive of the game is not the entire indicator, okay? But first drives or game are a small indicator of how well a coaching job is being done by the coaching staff. A well-coached team is going to come out and have success in the first drive. On Saturday, we had success on both sides of the ball. J.C. McDonald, our offensive coordinator, and our offensive staff have done a great job. And then John Kelling on defense and the defensive staff have done a great job of getting getting our young men prepared to play at the start of the game. As a team, uh, you rushed for 149 yards on the ground, highlighted by Gavin Lavat's 124 yards. Uh, was this a product you said last week you wanted to get him more reps in practice? Uh, he usually plays better when he has more reps. Was that something you emphasized this, that, this past week, or was it something else? He practiced more last week, and he, he took more reps last week, and he practiced better, and in turn he played better. I, I've said this now three or four times, and I'm going to quit saying it, but it matters to him. Uh, Gavin's a mature football player now, and, and, and football and Frostburg football matter to him. He played well on Saturday. Now on us running for 149, it's not enough. Um, our expectation as a coaching staff and one of our goals is that we run for 250 yards, and our goal is 250, 250, 250. We haven't gotten to that, but we need to. Gavin Levon, as we've seen this season, has had some success. Uh, you, you, we saw a lot more DeQuandre Marshall the first year in the in the backfield this game, and Malcolm Facey as well. Uh, those two running backs haven't had as many opportunities as Levon, but they haven't had as much much success. How do you build uh, as depth in the backfield in terms of getting Facey and Marshall a little more uh, explosive plays and more opportunities to, to add another level to the to the rushing game? Yeah, you build depth exactly what you're saying by playing them. You know, playing time and experience builds depth. Uh, Ma Malcolm deserves to play more th than he played the first four games, and he, he played quite a bit more on Saturday than he's been playing. Malcolm's going to play more as we get down the road um, because he's earned a right to play here. Good football player, hey, good good human being. Um, enjoyed having him around the last couple of years. Um, but but he, he's going to play more. Dequandre, he may be getting a little more playing time than he deserves. And most freshmen that are playing are. Um, but Dequandre is going to be a good player going forward here. Will Brunson, we know he's the coach's son. Had a clean game, zero turnovers, every coach's dream. Uh, in your opinion, was this his best game from first to fourth? No, I don't sit and compare the games. We just pick out everything they do right and everything they do wrong and let them know both sides of it, probably a little more of what they do wrong than, than what they do right. Um, on, on that note, Will's got to throw for a better percentage for us. Um, his passing percentage needs to be a little better than what it is. He, he missed some throws, missed some touchdown throws on, on Saturday, especially in, in the second half. He missed two touchdown passes that he should have hit. Um, we've got to get that corrected. On the turnover thing, um, it, you know, he, he's been really fun to coach from that aspect. And our running backs and receivers and tight ends, anybody that the ball's touched, um, they're refusing to turn the football over. You guys watch, watch a lot of football games, um, Fielder. The, the next 100 football games you watch, Watch who wins the turnover battle, and I'll bet you they win the game 75% of the time. On that note, we had zero turnovers on Saturday. Mm -hmm. if, if the next 100 Frostburg football games we have zero turnovers in, we're going to win 99 out of 100 of them. 
You don't have to tell me about the turnover battle as I watched my Dallas Cowboys throw three interceptions yesterday and be beaten by the Green Bay Packers. I'm well aware of the, the importance of the turnover battles in football. Yeah, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, the nation was talking about, you know, Dak's worth $50 million a year. And uh, what's the young man that, that I think is a good player that's quarterback down Baltimore Ravens? Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson, and he's worth fifty million. And then, as the as the NFL season goes on, both of them get exposed. And and this is why the best hundred and fifty defensive minds in the world are all working mm-hmm. in the NFL. If you have a flaw, they will find it and they'll expose you. And that's what happened. That's what's happening in Dallas and in Baltimore. Although Baltimore was able to squeak out a victory. What's happening in Frostburg is Lincoln Akubu is making highlight plays in back-to-back weeks. Uh, he had a touchdown reception, a uh, big catch that got you down on a third down to the two-yard line, and a punt return that was called back, but it was a really nice nice play. Uh, this is back-to-back weeks with big production. Has he emerged as a major threat for the Bobcat offense, and, and that being our opposing teams going to start circling number three to look out for when they uh, play Frostburg State? Yeah, and it's not just the last two weeks. Lincoln's been a player for us all fall. Lincoln was a player for us all last fall. Lincoln in 2017 was a really good player for us as a true freshman. Um, overlooked on the recruiting trail by some people, and we landed him here at Frostburg State, and, and he's proven his worth now. Um, in my opinion, Lincoln is one of the best football players in this conference. Take the receiver thing and throw it out of the window, okay? Lincoln is great on special teams. Lincoln is great at wide receiver. If we ask Lincoln to go block somebody, he goes and blocks them really, really hard. If we ask Lincoln Lincoln to run a route, he does it really, really hard. If we ran him down on kickoff, he'd be good. If Lincoln played outside linebacker or safety for us on defense, he'd be a really good football player. Um, and he would make plays at those positions. Lincoln's one of the best football players in the conference. Um, hadn't gotten enough due over the last couple of years, but I, I will tell you all this one. The young men that practice really hard and practice really well, usually turn out and play really, really well on Saturday. We get into our spring ball competitions. You know, we split our team up into small teams during the spring, and and we compete weekly on a weekly basis. We compete on a daily basis. Well, Lincoln's trying to win every single competition that he competes in. Well, what does he do when he goes out on Saturdays in the fall? He attempts to win, and in doing so, he makes a lot of plays, looks really good. A lot of the receivers, and and this is just coming from the broadcast booth watching, uh, the the route – an area of the field that really seems to be uh, highlighted for the receivers is that in the middle of the zone, uh, seam area, the receivers are getting open in those uh, pass patterns. Is that something you're looking at, soft spots in the zone, or is this just a, a situation where they're just getting inside position and, and Brunson's making some good throws? Yeah, we're going to take what the defense gives us. And, yeah, Lincoln set some success between the hashes. All of our wide receivers have the last couple of weeks. Um, it's what the last two or three defenses we've played have given us, which is they've mm-hmm. given us the middle of the field. Now, who knows, maybe this Saturday they, they're going to give us everything on the numbers. They're going to give us everything down the sidelines. And if that's what they give us, that's what we'll take. Um, I'll go a step further with you guys in, in saying this. The, the RPO is the big thing now, and, and yeah. we're probably as little vested in the RPO as anybody in the country because we, we run some RPOs, but it's about 10 or 15 percent uh, of what we're doing. On the RPO stuff, it's easier for the quarterback to read it if it's an inside breaking route. It happens faster. It's either easier for him to see it. It's an easier throw. So, so you're coming off of a play fake and a run fake, and you're reading a linebacker or a defensive end or a safety, and then you're trying to make a throw off of that. It's easier if it's breaking inside, and it just looks like that we're looking inside, and we're really we're not. We're just taking what's given to us. We've been – uh, focusing on the offense here in the first portion of it, but it really was the defense that jumped off the the screen uh, with bottling up one of the top rushing offenses, offenses overall in Urbana uh, in the MEC. Uh, what did you see that was encouraging going forward from that unit, uh, in particular at the front seven? Yeah, I, I'm going to leave a coach out here, but John Kelling and Pete Mayer and Kyle Wiggins and J.R. Lowry and Sean Madison and Matt Puffenbarger, and hopefully I've named everybody um, that they coaches, all of our coaches on defense. They do a great job of getting the young men prepared. That They had the guys extremely ready to go. They had them ready to go at 1 p.m. on Saturday, and it was, they were a lot of fun to watch. It was a lot of fun to see. Um, up until the last seven minutes 
and 30 seconds of the football game, and we have to do a better job finishing the game. But let's start with the first, you know, 52 and a half minutes of the game. We ran to the ball. We ran harder than Urbana ran. We played harder. We were more excited to play than Urbana was on Saturday. Um, they had no chance of running the football on us all day. Um, we, we were we were gap sound and had gap integrity and the young men that weren't getting the ball running their gap were running to the football in other gaps and we were wrapping up and we were tackling and we were excited to do so um in the past game mike mike bell has been huge for us in the past game you know that they they tried to hit some verticals on us and, and mike bell got his hands on a couple of them he got an interception mm-hmm. in the third quarter fourth quarter um which is mike's third of the season um do, doing a great job it, it, as as good a player as we have on defense right now, and it's taken him till his fourth year to become that good player that he is, but he's fun to watch right now. But we were good in the run game, pass game. Seven minutes and 30 seconds left in the game. We're up 24 to nothing, and we stopped playing hard, stopped executing, um, stopped making plays. In that last seven and a half minutes, we missed three, we missed three opportunities at interceptions, and then we stopped tackling the football. And – missed opportunities and when you stop tackling you're going to be in trouble and that's what happened to us at the end you mentioned michael bell that was his third interception of the season he's kind of taken the role of covering the opponent's best receiving threat and you said it's taken him for his fourth year and he's really really made some leaps and bounds what growth have you seen uh in his fourth year as opposed to the first three that's really jumped off the, the page from him it, it, as a freshman, as a freshman, it took him a while to adjust our football program and some of the expectations on and off of the field that we have for the players. And then into his sophomore year, he was having some problems with the calls and stuff and just knowing the calls and knowing his assignments because Coach Kelly makes a call from the sideline. And then depending on what the offense does, they have like seven options. They have seven different things they have to think about that they have to execute depending on what the formation is, what the receivers are doing, et cetera, et cetera. And it took him a while to get that. Last year as a junior, it started to make sense for him, and he started to make some plays for us and do some things and was a solid special teams player, solid member of our program. And then this year, he ain't been a star so far. Yeah, He's been a really, really good football player so far on defense and on special teams. His maturity on and off the field – it has been fun to watch over the last four years, Fielder, and we're going to enjoy the last couple months of it here. Staying with the secondary, Michael Bell was one of the examples. When we talked to Pete Mayer at the uh, halftime break, he, he mentioned the term setting the edge, and that's what the secondary, these cornerbacks were doing that stopped the run game, forcing the running backs back into the middle where the linebackers, defensive line are in pursuit. Was that important? Uh, was that a point of emphasis going into the season? But that just seems like something football 101, make sure you contain the running back, don't let him bounce outside. Yeah, it depends on what offense you're playing each week. In our banners offense with them running stretch and pin and pull and some of the stuff they were trying to do on the edge, yeah, it was important that we set the edge. It's not just the corners there. Our, 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 our corners, are they do a solid job at setting the edge, but there, there's plays where the defensive end set the edge. There's mm-hmm. plays where the outside linebackers plays where the safety. The, the term setting the edge during the course of the game pertains to about six different positions on defense where they have to set that edge. Yeah, we set, we did. We set the edge well on Saturday. I noticed Zach Strand in his in his uh, job of setting the edge lined up a little wider and and uh, stand up to make sure that he got a little more leverage. That was something that I noticed up in the booth. Uh, well, if you if you want details on why Zach Strand started lining up wider, we're 100 percent pass. We knew we were getting passed, and Zach Strand's going up against a guy. Zach Strand is five ten and a half, two thirty, and the six, kid he's five play, tackle. Yeah, it's yeah. six five, and it might have been six six. Yeah, and if they said he was three fifty, he was four fifty. <laughs> So, yeah, Zach being smart and our defensive coaching staff being smart like they are, just widen and take that really, really big guy and make him play Zach in space. Looking at the linebackers, Matt Meyer, Wayne Palmer, and Jake Brochart uh, made many plays. Mainly uh, Matt Meyer had a lot of tackles in, in the ball game as they allowed. Uh, th- they were allowed to fly around without the uh, Urbana blockers getting to that next level. Now you say they run that stretch kind of zone uh, format where they try and get down the line of scrimmage. Uh, how was, how did the defensive line halt the offensive linemen from getting to that next level? Is that a, something that you wanted to have these linebackers be able to fly around and play with some speed? Yeah, we're, we're going to be outmanned. Well, I shouldn't say outmanned because we've got better players than a lot of people. We're going to be outsized. 
We're going to play. Our D-line is going to play against offensive lines that are bigger than them throughout the course of this season. We already have several times. Um, that They're going to be quick. They have to cancel their gaps. Um, our defensive scheme is gap cancel. Gap cancel. It's not gap control. We're not too gapping anybody. So it's the start of the play. You know, we're canceling gaps, canceling gaps mm-hmm. with our guys. Um, when they get to canceling gaps, offensive lines start to try to double team people, and they do different things to try to – contain our defensive line when they do that it allows the linebackers to run free now you named a couple linebackers that are really good players you know matt, yeah. matt meyer's a good football player uh wayne palmer's been a good football player and a good leader and and, and a good citizen in our football program for a long long time now uh, wayne's been making plays for for several years here and matt has too um but but they've done a nice job for us and again hey just like we talked about michael bell uh, those two young men have gotten better each year they've been here and they're fun to watch this week you take on West Virginia Wesleyan College on the road. How does the focus shift when you're traveling at EMEC? Yeah, Battle of the Bobcats That's this right. week. We've got already the, had FSU. Now we go to the Bobcats. got the Battle of FSU, Battle of the Bobcats. Um, yeah, we're at Battle of the Bobcats, uh, they've invited us there to be their homecoming queen. You know, that's always respectful when you get invited to somebody's place on homecoming. Absolutely not. Uh, hopefully people can hear the sarcasm in my voice. Um, but we're, we're going to West Virginia Wesleyan. Um, it is a trap game for us. We're four and one. They're one and four. Um, West Virginia Wesleyan is well coached and Tony Testa and his staff have done a nice job with the resources they've been given of putting a football program together and making them competitive. Um, I fear that our players look at the schedule and look at the records and, and they handle their business that way. That, that, that scares me. Um, West Virginia Wesleyan plays better at home than they do on the road, and everybody in the country plays better and plays harder on their homecoming mm-hmm. than they do any other week of the year, just like we did this past Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we played really well this past Saturday because it was homecoming. It's exciting, and young people like exciting stuff. Um, Fielder, it's a 100% trap game for us. Um, I'm fearful uh, of this week. We're going to practice really, really well this week, and we're going to go down and play West Virginia Wesleyan in Buchanan just like we're playing for a conference title. Not, nothing any different than we do any other Saturday. What does this Bobcat offense uh, pose uh, in terms of issues for your team? They put the ball in the air a lot. That's going to be something that you have to adjust from this past, this previous week. Yeah, and and weeks past that they had, th- had thrown it more they had thrown it more than they had run it, and then this past week they were running a football, um, try, trying to get trying to keep the game moving against Notre Dame, get in and get out of town. Um, so it threw off some of their tendencies. Um, I think their quarterback is solid. Okay, they've got two or three offensive linemen that that we like, um, and then they've got a running back and two wide receivers that are very very capable of making plays against us. So we we have to make sure that we're diligent in our preparation. They flip over on defense. They got a nose guard that's a player, so they got a nose guard that's a good football player and he's fun to watch on film. They've got two linebackers that run around and and have a good time. And then uh, the the numbers that jump out at me number twenty. Um, which is a sophomore safety for them, is their best defensive player. And he runs around, makes plays, and he's energetic and having fun playing football. We've got to make sure we block him. And then number 18 for them, which, again, going back to the outside linebacker, excuse me, uh, yes, number 18 for them, runs around and plays with a lot of energy and excitement also. Um, that, that they do some things on special teams fielder that, that scare us. Uh, you know how we'll keep the offense out there and punt the football? Well, mm-hmm. they've kept the offense out and punted the football eight or nine times. If they get a matchup they like, if they get a matchup they like in that fourth down situation, they'll just go for it. They've gone for it on fourth and one, fourth and six, fourth and nine. So so they've gone for it in just about any situation this year. And any hey, when, when a team and a coaching staff is fearless, they make you fearful of playing them. Absolutely. About halfway through the season, this will be week six. Um, what have, what has been the most surprising about thing about your team as you reflect back on the first five weeks of the season? Are we almost halfway through? No, we're done. This is it. Last I was talking question. about in the season. Oh, yeah. Well, season. this yeah. This I'm is more. Than, I'm more than happy that this is the last <laughs> question. I'll promise you. This is uh. So we've played five games. This is week. Uh, six, well, back, back, back on this last question thing, you're going to let me out of here and actually let me go back to my office and do my job. This is it. What has been the most I, I surprising thing? What's it? Ask me the question again. So we're about halfway I'm joking, through. I'm joking with you. On being halfway <laughs> through the season, um, that, that there are times during the day when, when, when I smile and I'm like, it seems like we came into camp like two days ago. Mm-hmm. 
And then there's some times where you're, you're putting out fires and stuff on campus and chasing a young man to class and trying to get him set up with an English tutor. And you get to thinking, man, the season seems like it started 20 years ago. So, anyway, being halfway through the season is a little bit of a mixed bag for a coaching staff. Um, the most impressive thing about our football program, um, our assistant coaches, how hard they work and how much they care about the young men in our football program. Um, that, that, that is extremely impressive to me. And we talked about it yesterday, talked to them about it, to our coaching staff about it again this morning. Um, the, the extra work and, and guys are, we spend 65, 75 hours a week doing football. And then our coaches spend another 20, 25 hours a week working with the young men. Um, we, we've got coaches that are tutoring players and classes and coaches that are class checking them and coaches that are running study hall for two hours each night. Nobody at home ever sees that. Um, that, that, that's impressive. Um, now, on our young men, and I used to use this word and I went away from it, and then halfway through the game on Saturday it hit me that it's going on again. The word synergy. Um, the synergy that our young men have in this football program is really, really special. And I hope the parents and the fans and the alumni and the people that care about Frostburg football, I hope that they see it and understand what's going on because the sum of our whole – is much better than the parts. If, if, if you took our coaching staff and players and we, we all split up and went in different directions, we're, we're not great individually. We're, we're not. Uh, but, but all of us get in that meeting room and get in that film room and we all get on the field together and the synergy of our football program is something that's extremely impressive. And it, just a real, real, real quick example, you know, I, I don't – uh, Zach, Zach Strand, I think Zach Strand, if, if he's out individually by himself, I don't think he's as good as if he's in the whole group and in the entire program. On the flip side of that, Sean Madison and J.R. Lowry are his coaches. And I think if they're out, they're out on their own coaching other players, I don't think they're as good as if they're coaching him. I, I think the three of them being together is much more special than they would be split up individually. And hopefully I'm explaining what I mean well, well enough. But you asked what the, the thing that impresses me halfway through the season, the synergy of our football team, the way they stay galvanized together and we keep working together. Our guys never fray. There's never fighting on the sideline. And we're not throwing helmets and we're not cussing each other. And we're not doing the things that bad football programs do when bad things happen. We stay together and play play the next play the synergies is the synergy special it's impressive coach thank you so much for talking with us here on the bobcast and we'll let you get back to your office thanks for having me go bobcats back here for another edition of the bobcast episode number six we're talking field hockey my name is fielder dennis and i'm here with coach caitlin thompson coach the you basically had the week off this past week and what did the team do with that time yeah, so we had a day off on Monday and Tuesday we had, you know, an active recovery practice um, mixed with a little bit of team bonding, had some kickball, had a, had a good time. And then um, for the rest of the week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we had some tough practices trying to get our uh, cardiovascular numbers up. And then um, we took the weekend off. So we took Saturday and Sunday off. I think this was like a really good rest and recharge week um like i said we still we still worked hard in our practices that we had but um i mentioned last week we had five games in 10 days yeah. so i think um not only was it good for them to like rest a little bit physically but i think the good mental recharge should uh have our team nice and focused as we come into the last half of our season so we have 10 games down we have 10 more to go being independent this year, the, the schedule has, has seemed to be uh, in its construction. You've got a lot of games and then some break. Mm -hmm. and then a lot of games and some break. And that's kind of tough to, to get going, and then you take some time off and then you get going. How do you, you know, combat that in, in terms of focus and the mental side of things, knowing, okay, we've got five games in ten days, but then we'll have seven days off. And You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think uh, the girls have done, you know, they really try to focus in. And, you know, when we're going – when we're going hard and we have those those bouts of times that it's a lot in a little bit, they know that coming up it's going to be a little bit of a rest. So I think that that's kind of how they try to view it a little bit. Um, whether it, that's right or wrong, we'll, we'll find out. But I think that, you know, they've tried to do a good job of um, 
you know, our strength as a program is making sure we're fighting and staying in these games and giving everything that we have in every single game. Um, have we necessarily done that? Maybe not every single game, but I think for the most part that we have and um, we try to use that to our advantage. The old cliche is uh, a season is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. But the way these schedules are, it's almost kind of like there's some sprints and then stops and sprints. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's fair to, to say with just how it's been been going? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I, like I said, I think this last week was really good for our team to kind of you know, reset. And we talked, we talked about it after our last practice on Friday. Um, you know, we only have, like I said, 10 games left. We had, we've already played 10 games and, you know, we have 20 practices left, five weeks mm -hmm. left. Like there's not that much time left. So we need to make sure that we're really, you know, enjoying the moments that we have with each other, enjoying, you know, we're never going to be this team again. Um, obviously, Frostburg Field Hockey will go on, but, mm -hmm. you know, we're never going to be this team with these 18 people ever again. So making sure that we're really cherishing every moment, every practice, every lift, everything that we have with each other um, and making the most of it every single time, not coming out flat, but coming out ready to go. And I think that the girls – um, accomplished that this week. So we'll see how that translates as we go into our game tomorrow. You mentioned some team bonding activities for one practice. Do you think it's important to, to kind of grow and brew morale uh, through an entire season and just kind of remind the players, you know, that they're student athletes and they're all kind of on the same page in terms of where they are in their life with these team bonding activities? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, you know, our team, we have a special team in that we're, we're a really close knit team. You know, I don't, there's not really any major problems on our team. And I, you know, with a team that hasn't won yet, that that's rare to find. But I think that our girls do a good job of staying together and making sure they're playing for and with each other as much as they can. Um, so I'm really proud of them for that. But, yeah, it's it's nice every now and then to kind of get to do a nice fun practice, mm -hmm. play a little kickball and make ourselves look goofy out there so at the end of the day remind yourself you're playing a game yeah, it, it is exactly a game. Uh, what do you want to see from the team from a mental standpoint going through these next slate of games I just want to see us be relentless and really you know hunker down and be like this we're gonna win this game we're going to mm -hmm. I'm going we're gonna get a shutout this game or you know we're yeah. gonna score more than one goal this game um so because I think sometimes like we want to move on and play with next play energy but we also need to make sure that we're doing our our work on the front end of it as well um so yeah just really making sure that we come out with a lot of tenacity in these next few games from a schematic standpoint what do you want to shake up to maybe produce produce some more opportunities like you said have the mindset score than more than one goal do you want to try and move shake any things up in the starting lineup or, or formation wise i think just shaking some things up at practice um Obviously, our lineup is kind of limited, but we, you know, as you've probably seen, um, Morgan Matthews has been able to come into games a little bit more. She mm -hmm. came in with an injury, so that's kind of helped our forward line a little bit. But um, just shaking some stuff up in practice, you know, um, make playing a game on the front end and a game on the back end, so that way, you know, we start we start strong and start fast so the end end strong and end fast and cuz i don't think necessarily we've had that start start fast mentality um in the past couple games so really trying to again shake it up at practice so that way it translates over to game playing slippery rock tuesday that'll be like you said 10 games in thus far, and you have 10 left. That'll be past the midway point of the game mm -hmm. number 11. What has been a pleasant surprise to you as you reflect back on the first 10 games? I think, you know, we, we play a lot of freshmen in our mm -hmm. lineup. We have a lot of um, first years out there, and these first years, you know, have, have really grown a lot. Um, the biggest growth, you know, that I've really noticed is Alexa Fleming, and, you know, she – is someone who I recruited knowing that we would have to put a little bit of work in with her skill level, but she, her skill level has jumped so much from our first scrimmage into the last game that we just played. And just seeing that individual growth has been so great. And 
you know, Alexa's not the only one. We've seen some individual growth in Rachel Rallo and um, Emily Hughes, and those are two girls that, you know, they're starting freshmen in our backfield. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, you know, making sure that we still see that growth every single day is not only going to make them better field hockey players, but it's going to make our program better. And again, they're, they're first year players. So they got three more years after this to keep on growing. So it's, it's fantastic for us as uh, coaches to be able to see. I may have asked you this in the preseason, but just how valuable is it? Those, those reps for the first years and the sophomores this season that they're accumulating going forward in the careers you mentioned a little bit it's just it's so valuable for young players yeah and um again it's it's just nice to see because we have three more years with them it's not like um it's not like you know I think Logan Gladden has done a great job of growing this year um unfortunately this is going to be her last season with us but it is great that she's doing this growth in her senior year where Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, you know, when we see Alexa just out there growing every single day and, you know, really, really putting some great stick stick work and moves on um, some tough opponents, just knowing that, you know, she's grown this much in this little time. We have three more years with her. Like that's that's a fantastic thing as a coach to be able to watch. You play Slippery Rock on Tuesday. Uh You've played them before, correct? Yes. What challenges uh, do they pose to you, and what can you take from game one and put it towards in this one? So I mentioned um, that we need to be coming out strong, making sure that we're coming with a positive mindset and making sure that we're really fighting in this game. And um, I think that's something that we did lack in the first game. So, you know, I'm excited for the opportunity to be able to play them again. And I think the team is as well. Um, I don't think we played our best field hockey against Slippery Rock the first time around. So we're really excited to come out there and show them what Frostburg field hockey really should look like and be able to do it at home. So that's we're, we're excited for that opportunity. Coach Caitlin Thompson, I'm looking forward to that matchup with Slippery Rock on Tuesday. Thank you for the time. Always enjoy talking to you, and uh, thanks so much. Thanks. Back here on the Bobcast, fielded in us alongside Coach Keith Burns. Coach, we'll jump right into this past week, 0-2, and, and the matches against nationally ranked uh, Charleston, and then you finished the home-and-home home with d and What did you see from the team this previous week that, that you hadn't seen uh, earlier in this season? Any, any differences that jumped out to you? No. Um, I mean, I think we just, you know, the Charleston game, they're a very good team. And it, at this level, um, I mean, they're basically fully funded and we're just starting a D2 program. It, we're, we're a little ways off. Um, and you kind of got to do everything right against them to give yourselves a chance. Um, and they were really good at capitalizing on, you know, the few mistakes we made. I mean, the guys played hard. They worked their tails off. But, um, you know, the bottom line is their, their players were you know, impacting the game more than ours. Um, and when you do something that's kind of costly, they they have the ability to just kind of finish you off, and you know, that's what happened. The D and E game, we knew that would be, um, you know, the first game wasn't wouldn't be indicative. They were home, you know, we had come off uh, playing pretty well. They had a little bus issue getting there, so we knew there were some factors going into that game. And uh, the set first half was not was not good for us. They definitely dominated. I thought the second half we definitely. Uh, settled in, possessed very well. Uh, I thought we kind of carried the play for certain parts of the game, but I don't think we did anything to really threaten to score, which is unfortunate. We had a lot of possession without penetration and uh, you know, didn't really do anything to, to really kind of put them on their heels. And it was just a back and forth second half. And again, kind of you know, mistakes come up and bite you at this level. And uh, we, you know, we did something that allowed them to get the ball in our you know, right to the top of the box and they were able to counter on it. And put the game away with a couple minutes to go. And it was, you know, it's unfortunate because the boys did have a good second half, but we've got to start learning that, you know, at this point, uh, mistakes are costly. And, uh, you know, we need to capitalize and force some mistakes from other teams rather than having them kind of be the ones uh, on the benefit side of uh, cashing in on our mistakes. Looking at the uh, first matchup with Charleston, uh, playing a team like uh, University of Charleston could be seen as a measuring stick uh, for comparison did you see a ma- see the match like this uh, almost a, a chance for you to look kind of how how the team compares to to some of the uh like you said the scholarship players uh, of charleston 
Yeah, I mean, you, you want to see, well, one, you just want to see if that's the top team in the conference, where are we at? Because mm-hmm. uh, we thought we were competitive with everybody else. You know, even the losses were all one-goal losses. Um, and on a national level, obviously, they're the national-ranked team. They've got the national championship just going back two years. So it, it is a little bit of a barometer, but obviously their, their team's going to change from season to season as well. Um, so, it, you know, it showed us that, yeah, we've, we've got some work to do, um, you know, which is good because, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, we didn't expect it to be any different, but – it was kind of finally good to see it firsthand and kind of just get that game out of the way. And now it's just, okay, we're playing Charleston. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was definitely a, a, an indication of where we're at and where where we could be, um, but, you know, what it's going to take to get there. I asked uh, head volleyball coach Becky Fletcher the same thing. They played Wheeling, um, a team that's nationally ranked currently and won a national championship a few years back. It, can you learn something uh, from watching a team, whether it's how they warm up or just how they go about their business? Uh, a te- learning from a team of that kind of pedigree uh, going forward, is there something that can be uh, seen just from how they go about things? No, they do all the same stuff we do. They just do it better. Mm. I mean, talent is talent. Yeah. And, you know, they just have better first touches. They're more they're moving off the ball. But the tactics are all the same. Um, it's just they do it at a higher level. It's all the same game. Scoreless in the first half. Uh, did you did you like what you saw from the team early? Like you said, the, they they were uh, competitive. Uh, really, just kind of a bulldog mentality in that first half. Yeah, I mean, we 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 worked to defend. We knew, you know, we were going to be the type of team that was going to have to counter uh, and just make the most of the, any few opportunities that we did get. Um, just trying to, you know, hold on for that first game on the road against them, and, uh, and we were close. And then, you know. Unfortunately, the first goal was a little bit of a tracking error, but then, you know, a deflection off a defender helps the ball kind of just pop over the goalie's head. And and now you're down, and now you're on your back heel for the rest of the game. So, you know, do you keep it at one, or do you actually try to go and tie it up? So, um, you know, we didn't even really get to make that decision because they kind of scored early in the second half. But, um, you know, the first 42 minutes, 41 minutes, you know, we were we were pleased that we were – um, not giving up too many good scoring opportunities, although we did surrender possession for sure. Later, you played uh, D&E for the second time. Um, you mentioned some external factors going on in, in the first matchup. What do you think were the major differences uh, between the two matches, one being at home and then uh, traveling there? Let's they were see. active. Um, I thought they did a better job moving off the ball, and we weren't tracking, and we were pretty stagnant. Um and I think that allowed them to carry the play in the first half. And then, like I said, in the second half, we definitely made some adjustments. And um, I thought it was a, just a very good game in the second half. It was, you know, two teams kind of fighting out in the midfield and it wasn't many shots in the second half. And, you know, you just you, you hope to create that mistake and get the easy goal. And I, that's what they kind of did. So we didn't, like I said, we didn't do much to, to win it and threaten. And they capitalized on our mistake. You have a couple of home uh, home matches here with Western New Wesleyan College in Salem this week. Uh, what do you want to see from the squad in the match with uh, Western New Wesleyan College? Is that's one of the top tier teams in the MEC uh, in conference play right now. Well, we expect to do what we did the previous games. I mean, at least against Urbana and Notre Dame, and you know, if you want to throw D and E in there, just like be competitive with them because we think we're in that playoff team caliber. Mm-hmm. Um, but only when we're playing, you know, for 90 minutes and not making mistakes and not switched off for a half because that's when you give up those goals and you end up losing the close game. But we're, we're capable of competing. Uh, I think we've shown that with anyone in the conference other than probably Charleston right now. So we expect to hopefully, you know, if we're at home, maybe get a little bit of an advantage there and, um, you know, ideally get some points from it. Uh, and we need to. I mean, right now we're in a position where we've, we've got to start taking some points from some of these teams that are a little bit ahead of us. Uh, the second time through in the standings, uh, otherwise we're going to get left out, and uh, you know we don't want to be there. We want to we want to try to get into a playoff run here with our in our debut season. You talk about uh, playing a complete game, two halves, and and I'm uh, sp- speaking with Coach Brian Parker. He mentioned how difficult it is in the game of soccer to stay focused for 90 minutes. Do you think it's a just a mental side, maybe a focus that will uh, help attribute to to getting a complete game from the players? Oh, for sure. I mean, that's that's what it comes down. I mean, your talent didn't change during the game. Mm-hmm. You're just your mental focus kind of drops off. Your intensity drops off, and sometimes the score kind of dictates that. You kind of think it's in hand. You know, they always say two zero is the most dangerous score because you think it's over, and the other team's fighting just to get right. that one. Um, or it just could be the flow of the game. You know, you're kind of 
in a lot of possession you're getting a lot of shots and you just you know, kind of fall asleep and they get a quick counter and all of a sudden or a set piece and you know now now you're down and you know you're behind and you should have been uh, up um so yeah it's it's a battle you talk about it all the time and it's not something you can necessarily train for as much it's just, just got to drill it into their heads and hopefully get them prepared for it um and remind them that you know that's it's always a possibility that they you know they can't let can't get complacent can't think the game's over always got to play to that last whistle and you know hopefully coming on the right side of that playing a non-conference foe in salem allows for an opportunity to tweak some lineups and try some things are you looking to maybe do that this week I don't know. I mean, that was in a, uh, you know, obviously in the back of our heads initially. Um, mm-hmm. But after the the rough week and the losses, you know, obviously we we want to make sure we get back on the right side of winning, uh, just for confidence sake. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure which is more important uh, for the team. You know, just getting everybody in or making sure we win, going into that that second stretch of the home and aways with everyone in the MEC. So, um, maybe a little bit of both. Uh, I'm sure we'll be a little bit more liberal with the substitutions, but I think we need to win to make sure. Uh, the guys are feeling good about where they're at. Coach Keith Burns, thank you for the time. Looking forward to the matches this week and uh, finally get to get, have you guys home. It's always fun to, to go out in that atmosphere. All right, thank you.